I'm Lisa Stone. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Parenting Aces. Thanks for tuning in to the Parenting Aces podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and we have with us again this week, Coach Todd Whittem, two weeks in a row, which I can't even, I don't think that's ever happened. But before I jump into what's going on with Todd and what we're talking about this week, I want to just remind you guys that if you haven't already, make sure that you subscribe to parentingaces.com. You can do that by clicking on the link on the sidebar of every page of the website. And also that you're following us on our various social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, because I've been sharing some great information on those different social media outlets. And I don't want you to miss anything that might be helpful or important to you and your child's tennis development. So give us a follow. It's very simple. If you go to parentingaces.com, you'll see all the social media icons on the top right. And you can just click on those and click follow and voila, you're done. So very, very simple. I also want to point out that the fall college tennis season is underway. There are events happening all the time across the country. So keep an eye out. And if you have an opportunity, if you have a free weekend, maybe pack your kids up and take them out to watch some great college tennis. And there's stuff happening at all divisions, D1, 2, 3, NAIA, junior college. I mean, it's it's happening in at every level all across the U.S. And I want to just encourage you to get out there and support your local college players. I promise you they appreciate it more than you ever will know. So getting to back to this week's episode, uh, last week, Todd and I chatted about tennis parents and our role as parents. This week, we shift gears and talk about coaches and the different types of coaches there are out there. And so I hope that you find this informative if you are looking for a coach for your child or Or if you're looking to change coaches, maybe things are uh, not going as planned and it's time to make a change. Hopefully, our conversation this week will help you in that endeavor. So relax and enjoy this week's conversation with Coach Todd Whittem. Todd Whittem, I get you again so soon after our last podcast. Thanks for coming back on the show. Thank you very much, Lisa, for having me once again. Well, it's so interesting because last week's podcast where we talked about the role of the tennis parent has really gained a lot of traction. (laughs) We, a lot of people seem to be very interested in what you had to say about that. And so I think it's only appropriate that we switch gears. And this time we talk about the role of the coach and specifically the different types of coaches that are out there. And this was your idea. So I'm going to let you kind of kick us off on this conversation. But when you say different kinds of coaches, what specifically are you referring to? Well, as, as we always think about each and every child is, is different. They may learn differently and they may be, may respond differently to different types of coaches. And, and there are many different types of coaches. You could have coaches that are very, very technical coaches. You can have coaches that maybe aren't so technical. They're teaching you more about tactics. You could have um, coaches that were formerly unbelievable players on the, either the ATP tour or the WTA tour. You could have all different backgrounds. There are even coaches that never even touched a racket, can't hold a racket properly, but they're tennis coaches and they've had phenomenal tennis coaching careers. So there's many different types of coaches out there and you you really need to know what is going to work best for your child. So let's talk about the pros and cons of each of these types of coaches. And let's assume that I'm a parent, I'm in the market for a coach for my child, and I really have no idea where to start. So let's talk first about the technical coach, because that seems to be 
the question I get the most from parents is, you know, can you please refer me to somebody that can clean up my kids' strokes? Sure. So I, I can tell you that m- many coaches are, are love, love to be on the technical side of things. And the foundation for your child for when they start to play tennis is, is very important. They need to try to have proper grips and, and, and maybe swings and, and, and those are extremely important. Then you may, you may shift into then learning how to move and, and, and maybe, maybe fitness and, and tactics. And, and there's all different things that each and every kid needs to, needs to work on. But what, what I'm seeing is maybe there's an overemphasis on, on technical, on technical coaching. For example, Naomi Osaka, who just won the U.S. Open, her forehand w- wouldn't be taught, but because she's such a phenomenal athlete, she she can get away with it. And and there's many technical deficiencies if you're if you're even looking at some of the best tennis players in the world that they have, but it works for them. For example, there's no there's no tennis coach out there that that's going to teach your your son how to hit a forehand like Jack Sock. <laughs> I was just thinking Jack? that. <laughs> Ab- absolutely, it works for Jack. Naomi Osaka has a has a has technically you know a, a forehand that that you would you wouldn't teach, but it works great for her. And I can tell you from example that if a coach came in and tried to change that technique, their career might be over. So you have to be very careful about what type of coach you're you're choosing for your son or daughter. Well, let me ask you this, Todd, because. There are, you know, we, we've talked about this before, all these forums out there on the internet where coaches and parents and others talk about a variety of topics relating to tennis. And one of the topics that seems to come up all the time is, you know, what's the proper forehand? What's the proper grip? What's the proper backhand? And I can tell you, as someone who's been playing tennis for pretty much my whole life, my coach just recently changed my grip for my volleys and I'm going nuts right now. <laughs> it's it's so painful to change something at this stage of the process and you know my brain being the age I'm at doesn't handle this kind of change very well. Um obviously it's much easier to to make those kinds of changes as the kids are developing. But you know, why is there so much conversation over the right type of forehand, the right type of backhand? And, and I mean, do coaches need to kind of back off that conversation? Well, I think, I think every case is different. Um, if for, for, for the viewers that, that um, are listeners that have that listened to our last uh, podcast, um, it all it all depends on what each child needs. Now, I've had kids, like like I said in the last podcast, that my business it started it started about having to try to fix up some kids late in the ball game so that they could go on to play great great college tennis. So there were there were techniques that needed to be fixed. Now that late in the ball game is is it, do you really want to be fixing technique? No, it's it's not ideal. That's why that's why. I, I've said that the foundation for your for your child and getting getting these getting these things correct from from the beginning is key. So, and 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 I can tell you from it from experience, and I'm and I'm and I'm still currently doing it. Is that if there's something major, a major technical deficiency with with a junior tennis player, it's going to take six to nine months to to clean it up and you have to work at it every single day. And and I've written articles for you Lisa about this. Mm-hmm. And and I'm just and I'm and I'm, and I'm telling you from experience. Um right. so is there an overemphasis on technique? I believe there's a big overemphasis on technique and I've trained many kids that are frozen because there yeah. because there's been so much emphasis on technique and and it's it's basically a a paralysis by by analysis. And so mm-hmm. I've had to try to you know, communicate to to the child and to the parents that we need to unlock their brain and we need to make this a lot more fluid, less technical, and there needs to be it needs to be natural. Everybody's body is different. The way they may hold a racket is different. Their, their background of training can be different, but 
at the end of the day, it needs to be natural for your son or daughter, the way that they play tennis. And what I'm seeing is a lot of, a lot of junior tennis players, they're locked up, they're stiff and they're very rigid and they don't have a good feeling for the ball. And, and they've taken many, many tennis lessons, but to me, it, it's, it's just not natural. And what they're trying to do with the racket head, uh, whether it's their swing or an impact it, to me, it, 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 it's, it's just not natural. Interesting. And do you find that the coaches that really fixate on technique, like like we're talking about, are those coaches who are former players? Are they coaches who maybe came to tennis having coached other sports? Can you can you even generalize that? Well, I think a great coach looks at each case. And, and they and they see if the techniques work for that individual. That to me, that's number one. When 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 a parent calls me and wants me to look at their son or daughter, and I put them through my assessment, that that's what that's what I'm looking at. Does the does their current technique work for them? If it's a weird swing, you know, Jack Sock, Naomi Osaka, they may have weird looking forehands, but it works beautifully for them. To me, it would be wrong for me to even touch that. They 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 already have it ingrained, and and it works very well for them. So, um, you know, I mean, I I think I think it 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 always goes on a on a case to case basis, in 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 my opinion. Mm-hmm. And so, okay, we we talk about the technical coach, then there's the tactical coach. What is that coach doing with your with a child? Sure. Well. Well, to, to go back to go back with it with the, to to answer your question, also with the technical coach, is a technical coach may be so fixated on on technique because they might not have a great background on how to teach tactics, so they have to teach something. So maybe they're great with with young kids, right? Teaching you know maybe grips and swings and, and those types of things. Maybe I mean hopefully they're they're teaching a great foundation for that. If if they're if they don't really truly understand how to teach you know teach teach youngsters how to construct points properly and maybe compete properly and and the physicality and 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 how to be moving properly on the court and and all those different types of things for for example about a week ago I was listening to a TED talk with Tony Nadal and he was talking about Rafa and he was saying how the basis of their training when when Rafa was a junior was number 1 Tony was not going to get fired Right. That was number one. So he had the freedom to do what he wanted. And he said that I based my training and, 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 and the viewers and the listeners can can look this up on YouTube is that he spoke a lot about character. And he said, we did not have a big emphasis on technique. But once again, he wasn't running a business. What he was doing was trying to develop a world class tennis player. So the, so it, it really depends on what the what the goals are of the coach as well. So. You know, and, and I can tell you as well from uh, from my experiences is that a coach that is maybe over technical, there when when the child starts having maybe some difficulty with a stroke, a forehand, or back, and they become very reliant on that coach to to ask them, hey, is it this or is it that? Is it the angle of the wrist? The way that the toe is the all these different types of things. And then a player, a player can be locked up and, and, and they're going to be in trouble. Got it. So you're talking about like in the middle of a match when a stroke goes off. Correct. And then they come back to practice the next week and no, there was something wrong with my forehand and this, and they become very reliant on the coach to, to say, Hey coach, can, I need this fixed, that fixed. And, and uh, really that's not what tennis is about in my opinion. Well, so are you saying that they're reliant on fixing the stroke as opposed to figuring out a way to win despite the fact that the stroke has gone off? Well, yeah. I mean, the, the, okay. the vast majority of matches at, at any level, whether you're a, you know, a developing junior or college player or professional player, many, not not many things, but things will be off the vast, vast majority of times. There will maybe be if, if if your child plays maybe one or two tournaments a month, there could be maybe one or two matches a year where everything is clicking for them. So they're going to have to come up with solutions on their own to be able to compete well and and try to try to come away with a W in in, in those matches. And sometimes that's a technical fix, and sometimes it's a tactical fix, and sometimes it's a mental fix, right? 
100 percent true yes yeah uh, and I guess sometimes it's a, a feet fix as well. I mean, movement's such a big part of the sport. Well, and yeah, I mean, if if you want to go go into movement, so tennis is a movement sport, and so when I see when I see you know o- o- over technical things being taught, many times we forget about the legs and the feet. So techniques change when when a player is not in position, whether they're reaching for the ball or the ball is too close to their body or, or they didn't move up to the ball properly or their core positioning is, is, is not proper. Maybe children that are crowding the baseline and, 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 and they shouldn't be, and may, or maybe they're too far back and, the, and they shouldn't be too far back in the, in the court. So mm-hmm. techniques are always changing. If, if in a hand fed, in a hand fed drill or, or a bucket fed drill, techniques can stay the same because you're feeding the same exact ball. But in a live ball situation, techniques are always changing because the different balls being hit at you all the time. It could be a flat ball being hit at you. It could be a moon ball. It could be a heavy tossing ball. It can be a slice. So you're, you're always adjusting to different types of balls being hit hit at you, but also you need to be in position and, and many different positions to be able to strike the ball. Right. Right. So, okay. So we started out by saying there are a bunch of different kinds of coaches. So we've got the the technical coach, we've got the tactical coach, we've got the movement coach, we've got the, what else? Uh, Mental? Or is that just totally separate anyway? Uh, well, I, I would hope that the tennis coaches could, could help out a junior tennis player mentally as well, that Obviously, there are sports psychologists, but that that's a that's a different uh, you know that that's a whole different ball game. But um, um, emotionally, you know, a, a coach needs to know how to handle the, the the players as well. And so, what should a coach be teaching a developing player about handling emotions on the court? I mean, what are some of the conversations that that Let's say I'm not talking about the kid that's very composed and, you know, always behaves perfectly on the court because there are a handful of those out there. I didn't parent any of those, but but I know they do exist. I've seen them. Sure. Um, but so let's say you've got a kid who is feisty out there and quick to anger. And so what do we do about that? I mean, gosh, you know, the, the Serena conversation is still going on, you know, weeks after the U.S. Open has, sure. is over. We're still talking about her blow up in the final versus Osaka and, you know, what kind of role model she is and, and kids looking up to her and emulating that behavior. And, you know, obviously as parents, we don't want that, but, um, what, what's your role, Mr. Coach to fix that? Well, first of all, does it need to be fixed or does it need to be tweaked a little bit? Right. Is, is is the way that I look at it. A player that gets disappointed or frustrated with themselves, maybe when, when they're not, when they're not performing like the way that they feel that they should, to me, that's great. That means that they care. Okay. So, but maybe acting up and throwing rackets and, you know, hitting balls out out of the court and, and all those things. Okay. That's not acceptable, obviously, but you need to teach to me, you need to teach the, the, the juniors, how to channel that energy and make it into a positive so that they can continue to play at a high level. Now, and, and I have these discussions with, with kids that I train quite often when, when they're maybe acting up or not having a good moment is that it's one thing to get down on yourself and, and use it as fuel to raise your level of tennis which usually is not the case for juniors. So, right. Sorry to tell you parents that are listening <laughs> right. to this, right? When, 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 when your child gets upset with themselves, usually they're whining and crying and bitching and those types of things, and their level is going to go down. Right. So that's not good. But if you're watching a great tennis player, for example, US Open just, just finished not too long ago, and it may be hard to tell on TV, and, and obviously with the noise of the crowd after each point, but these players may be yelling and screaming or, or, or voicing their opinion about how they're playing. And what they're really trying to do is they're trying to raise their level. Or it could be a very stressful moment in the match, so they're letting go of some of the emotions. But they're not whining. That's not what they're doing. So 
for for a young developing junior tennis player, they need to understand their emotional state, but they also need to understand how to raise their level of tennis and make sure that it's not negative when when they're when they're maybe trying to voice you know something that maybe is not going so well for them at that moment. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the issues that I found as a tennis parent watching my child out there competing was the officials that are at these tournaments, you know, some of them are are very hands off and wait until there's a real problem before they interject themselves in a match. But but there are officials out there who are quick to get involved and, you know, even just walking around a facility if they hear something happening five courts away, they'll beeline over there and inject themselves into the match. And I know one of my kids' frustrations with the sport as a whole, and I've heard this from other kids as well, is that you're not allowed to express emotion out there. You know, you, you get coded, you get penalized. And so I know you're talking about letting go of steam in order to raise your own level of play, but it's a fine line, isn't it? Absolutely. And and I can tell you from when I was playing amateur or, or pro tennis, e- each and every ref is different. I was respectful to the refs. They knew that I was trying really hard on the court and uh, you know, I, I may have been I may have been tough on myself at times, but I also knew what the ref the refs would tolerate and what they wouldn't tolerate. So you have to use your common sense as well. And I have <laughs> I have these discussions with the players I'm training as well. Why did I get coded talking this and that? Well, you aren't too smart. Sorry to tell you, they already gave you a warning and then you, you did it again or you pushed their buttons more and you couldn't control yourself. So you're going to get coded. But once they once they give you a warning, then you you need you know you you need to quiet down and and, and make sure that you're respectful and uh, and and go on from there. And, and I can I can tell you. I can tell you a story from my young junior days was that I was trained at a very young age at, a, at about seven years old to be pumping my fist and getting very excited and, and all those things. And, and that was not really my personality off the court, but on the court, I let out my emotions all the time. And so, and I knew that I played my best tennis under, you know, pump, pumping fists and getting super excited when, when good moments were happening and, and and so it made me mentally tougher. It got me more pumped up. It got me more energized. I played at a higher level. For me, it worked. Now, when a ref came over and said, "Todd, do me a favor, stop pumping your fist and make sure it's not in, not in the sight of your opponent," I respected that. So I would I would turn away and I would do it, and 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 they were fine with that, and that that was okay. So mm-hmm. it just depends on the situation. You have to kind of be smart about it, and you have to understand what works for your child. Now, you may have a child who's who's an introvert, who's very quiet, and they play their best tennis that way, which is fantastic. It just all depends on each case. And I can tell you another story is that Rafael Nadal is an introvert off the court. He's very quiet. He's very to himself. He's calm. His, some of the favorite things that he loves to do off the court are, are to go fishing and play golf. Okay. Now on the court, when he's a tennis player, and he's in and he's in a tough competition and matches and everything and he's pumping his fist and he's jumping up and down that's actually not natural for him but i'm sure tony and and all the other people that helped him develop into an unbelievable tennis player have have expressed it to him that that is the best way that you play your top level of tennis and so that's why you see what's going on so that is something what you're saying is is the coach should be helping a child identify these things and learn how to utilize them. If, if I'm understanding you properly. Correct. One, 100% correct. And so how do you practice this stuff? Because that's the other tough thing, right? You know, it's, it's one thing to have an understanding of, you know, this is how I'm supposed to behave. And, you know, these are the things that are okay to say and do. These are the things that are not okay to say and do. But when you're in the heat of competition, sometimes all that goes out the window. How do you simulate those situations as a coach to ensure that your players are as well prepared as possible when they're in an actual tournament situation? Sure. Sure. The practices that, that I put the players through in, in my system 
are very competitive practices. Okay, so I want to see what they're made of, how how much how much pressure they can be under and thrive. Do they love the pressure? Do they do they play better under pressure, or does their level go go down under pressure? So all these things are are things that I'm looking at, and um and and they're always assessed during during practices, and it could be. It could be just challenging a student during practice in a, in a, in a, in a very simple forehand cross court drill is, well, we're, we're, we're not going to take a break until you get five in a row or 10 in a row on these specific marks. I want to see it over and over and over again. And, and, and you challenge the student and, and, uh, and they, they need to be determined to, to get the job done. And, and, you know, that's, that's that's life. It's life, and and to me, it's it's a developing junior tennis player. If one week they can they can hit five forehands on a certain mark on the court consistently, then the next week can they do six? Can they do seven? Can they do ten? What 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 is it? How what can they do? And and how consistent can can they be at doing it? And and how how quick developing are they? Mm-hmm. And what if you have in practice one of your players just lose it? How do you handle that? Uh, well, it's not pleasant, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, and 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 quite quite honestly, I'm glad to hear you don't enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it, it's it's not pleasant, and uh, but w- what do I do? Well, I run my own business, so I don't work for anyone. Now, if I worked for someone, I may not be able to reprimand that 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 child because I may be in fear of losing my job. Um, the parents of, of, of the children that I'm training on a daily basis, the communication is usually very good. And so they understand that if something is, is not going well or, or their child acts up, they have given me the green light to do what I feel is necessary for that child. For me to get upset at a child for not acting well, it's not in the benefit of me. For me to, you know, and I don't do this often, but to go yell and scream or, or run, a, run a child and reprimand them and, and do it all the time, that, that's not fun. And, and it's not something that I want to be doing all the time. But if I do end up doing that in a practice, then it's for the best interest of that child. So, you know, and that, that's, that's kind of the way that I look at it. And, and each case is different. So I may be reprimanding a child, and I've done it plenty of times for them not acting well. But once I'm done with them, I go and, and, and start training the others and I totally change my tone and everything to make sure that they understand that it was for that particular child. But now I'm going to the rest of the kids that I'm training and, and we're working on stuff that we need to work on. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that, that's kind of the way that I do it. Yeah. So you see your role as kind of everything. I mean, as a coach, you're working on technique, you're working on tactics, you're working on the mental game. I know you work on fitness with them because I see your videos on social media all the time. <laughs> uh, those poor kids. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Lisa, they have it very well. I know. <laughs> I'm, very, I'm kidding. Very nice life. <laughs> I am kidding. I am kidding. But, but the impetus behind having this conversation and and doing a podcast around it is that not every coach embodies all of these different aspects of the game and you know that that parents need to understand that they need to ask the questions right you know where is your area of expertise what what types of things are you going to be working on with my child is that, am I saying that right? Correct. Correct. It, it's, it's very rare for a coach to take a, take a junior tennis player from, from their beginning stages when, when maybe it's six, eight, 10 years old and take them all the way through to when their tennis career ends, which could be at 18. It could be at, at 22 when they graduate from college, or it could be on, on, on the professional tour. So and and, and, I, and I've spoken about this in, in other podcasts is that the coaches that I started with and, and that I finished with, they were able to do this, which is rare. It, does, it doesn't happen all the time. And so, like I said, I, I had two Argentine coaches from when I was six to when I retired from the ATP tour at 26. And then there were a couple other coaches involved that maybe traveled with me on the tour. And, and we, we know that Jay Berger was my 
my college tennis coach at the University of Miami, but he was hitting in my lessons when I was six years old. So I had already a very good relationship with him. And, um, and so that's, that's, that's basically it. But I, I had, I had basically the same coach for, from when I was six to 26 years old. Well, and so one of the things that I know drives you crazy is that a lot of juniors now are going through coaches like water. I mean, they're just, you know, they're six months with this coach, then they move to that coach for a few months and then another coach. And what does that do to overall development in your opinion? Um, there is no development. <laughs> or very, very little. <laughs> so, so, sorry to tell you, sorry to tell you the, the honesty about this and the parents that are listening to this is that if something needs to be fixed in your child's game, it's going to be minimum six months to nine months. It could be even longer depending on what you're working on. And you may be working on multiple things at the same time. It just all depends. But if you're hopping around from coach to coach to coach, you're, you're not going to be getting much accomplished. And, and really, every time that you hop around to different coaches, not only if, if the coach cares, not only does the coach need to understand the background, they need to understand the, the previous training. They need to understand the parenting involved. They need to understand maybe how big your child is going to be if, if, they're, if they're in their growing years and, and that type of thing. They need to understand how to connect with your child emotionally as well. And so if you're hopping around, none of these things can be accomplished. It's not, to me, to me it's, it's, it's not possible. You, you're, just, you're just having your child hit tennis balls in different environments. And, and really, if, if, if that's what you're doing, I would not be looking for, for big time results for your child. I just, I just wouldn't. I don't see how, how, how there could be great results if, if, if that's what you're doing and great improvements for your child. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. The junior development years, there is a finite period of time. I mean, at the end of your child's 18th yeah. year, they're finished in junior tennis. They're done. They can no longer right. compete right. as a junior. So every time you have a setback, you know, or like you're saying, hop from coach to coach, which is a setback, you're losing time that you cannot get back. And that's one of the hardest things lessons to learn because I mean, we went through it in our family where, you know, we realized we had wasted some time and it's heartbreaking to come to the realization that, you know, you're not getting that time back. Uh, the clock is continuing to tick and therefore that next decision takes on that much more importance, which puts that much more pressure on everyone which is never a good thing. You, you couldn't have said it any better. That's that's a hundred percent accurate. Yeah. Um, you have a certain amount of time to develop many different skills for 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 your child to develop many different skills and for them to achieve their goals and dreams with with their tennis, whether it's playing junior tennis or college tennis or or even professional tennis and you have to try to minimize the mistakes and and people are going to make mistakes no no one's perfect when i look back on my career there were mistakes that were made it didn't it was not coaching mistakes there were other mistakes that were made but um you have to try to minimize as much as you can so that there is no time wasted or spent with your child plateauing in their tennis development because if that's the case then you're really, really behind what, what's what's necessary for your child to be developing. Mm -hmm. And that said, I mean, there are times where a change of coach is necessary and warranted. Of course, it, of course, if if your if your child is plateauing or even regressing, um, you have to look at the reasons why that could be happening. And and you have to be, you have to really keep an eye on, really why why is that happening? And and uh, to me that 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 really should not be happening when you're developing junior tennis player. You should always be trying to get better. Now, 
will the results show it all the time? No, maybe, maybe a child ages up into the next division and the kids are maybe bigger and stronger or whatever it shall be. Maybe the results aren't there in the beginning, but from a, from, from a parent watching your child, maybe at, at a tournament, you should see, Oh, wow, this looks better. This, this, this is being developed. And this, you know, my, my child is getting stronger. My, my child maybe is getting tougher mentally. My child is competing better. Those are the things that you really need to be looking at. And uh, hopefully, hopefully the, the children are not plateauing. That's something that you do not want to happen. And obviously if, if they're regressing, there's, there's major problems. It could, it could be coaching. It could be off the court. It, you know, who, who knows? It could be school problems, but you would hope that that is not happening. Well, and what I was going to say is that if your child is regressing and you notice it and you go to the coach and have that conversation, hopefully the coach has noticed it as well or is going to explain to you why what you're seeing isn't regressing necessarily, but a step toward a, a bigger goal that that they've set, right? Um, because just because a kid, like you said, goes through a losing streak, that doesn't mean that they're regressing necessarily. It may mean that they're working on a specific stroke or a specific tactic that they just haven't perfected yet and give it three to six to nine months and you're going to see a big turnaround. So, I would say as a parent, if you have concerns about that stuff and you go to the coach and say, hey, what's going on? And the coach can sit down and give you an explanation of why you're seeing what looks like regression that makes sense to you, then you have to trust the coach and and stick with them. If the coach says, yeah, your kid's losing. Um, yeah, I don't know what's going on. Then to me, that would be problematic and and perhaps a reason to investigate moving to another coach. Do you agree with that? Well, yeah. If if a coach says that is 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 coaching really a career or is it or is it just more of a hobby? I mean, they they should they should be saying more detailed information than that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, there, there's many people that can just pick up a bucket of balls and, and start coaching a kid, but is it their career or is it just like a short-term thing to make money? Uh, that's a, that's a whole different scenario. Um, it, it should be it should be very detailed of what's what's being worked on, what what's trying to be accomplished on a daily basis, and uh, and 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 you go from there. And really, what what are the goals and where where should we be in a certain amount of time? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that kind of leads us to kind of the next point, which is, you know, the coach that just is out there to get paid hourly for teaching tennis lessons versus somebody who has committed their career to it. And, you know, one of the things that comes up all the time is these celebrity coaches now that we're seeing on the pro tour. And this has been going on for several years now where former players are coming back into the game as coaches. And it seems to work a lot of times on the professional tour at the junior and college level. How well is that working? I can tell you, I can tell you about the pro tour is that, professionals that you're seeing on TV, they are obviously very produced tennis players. They went through an incredible amount of hours training for them to be where they are. Now, are they going to all of a sudden have drastic changes in, in, in their game and need all these things fixed for them to become even better? No, it's very, very small little tweaks and, and changes that all of a sudden, if you make them or help them 5% or 10% better that could make or break their career mm -hmm. right it could it could all of a sudden they're now going very deep in tournaments or winning grand slams and so if you're hire, if these professionals that you're seeing on TV and they're hiring big name ex professionals that's kind of what's going on all they need to do is help them just a little bit and their career may drastically change for the better. Now, a developing junior tennis player, that's not the case. <laughs> that's, that's completely the opposite of the case. 
of, of now what I'm going to go into is that a developing junior most likely needs many different aspects worked on in their game. And it has to happen every single day. And, and you need to be trusting that individual and they need to have a, a great background in, in, in changing and, and, and undoing and fixing and, and, and teaching discipline and all these different things so that your child can, can, can achieve what they would love to achieve in their tennis career. A player, a, many, many players on tour, and I can tell you from, from example, they, they may just bring their friend on tour because they need a companion. They're, they're, they're maybe a little lonely. It's a tough road out there. You know, they've had tough matches. They need someone to talk to after their matches. And that's not a tennis coach. That's, that's just bringing a friend who's just helping them out. So it, it really, you, you can't compare what's going on on, on the tour compared to a developing junior tennis player. There's just, there's no comparison in my opinion. So can a former professional player be a good developmental coach? I think, of course they can. It all depends on how well they can, com- can communicate and how well they understand how, how, how to coach. Um, communication is, is, is key. So if, if, if they have trouble communicating information on on many different things, whether it's technical, tactical, physical, then it's 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 not going to work for your child. Now, can they go and hit with your hit with your child and 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 work them out and then do those things? Yeah, I mean it would be a it would be a great hit and and a, and a great workout and everything. But it all depends on it all depends on what you need. Um. So, what I can say is that. Many times a great player wants to become a coach and things may have come a little easy for them in the game of tennis, right? They're, they're super, they were super talented. They were incredibly talented physically. They were incredibly talented with their hands or eye hand coordination. I can tell you from, a, from experience that I was blessed to be training with and, and competing with some of the best players in the world and some of the best players to ever touch a tennis racket. And I would look across the net and I, and I would just say to myself, first of all, I don't know how they're doing what they're doing and it's just natural. And I could train all day long and still not be able to do what they're doing. That's why they're so phenomenal. It's just natural for some people. So it, it really all depends. Would they, would that particular individual be able to coach your coach, your son or daughter and, and teach them how to do these things that came came to them so naturally and easily, that may be a little difficult. So, I mean, you're a former professional player. How did you hone your coaching skills? Well, first of all, I was, I was studying tennis at a very young age. Um, I was at the courts all day long. I was obsessed with tennis. I was watching what, what my two coaches were doing, the, the two Argentine coaches that I was working under. I was used as a hitting partner many, many times I was listening to what, what they were working on with, with other players. So for, for me, it came, it came a little quite natural that, uh, that I would go into coaching and and quite honestly, tennis did not come that easy to me. There were many things that I had to work at to be able to achieve anything, whether, whether it was in amateur tennis, junior tennis, college tennis, and then in pro tennis, for me, it didn't come, it didn't come that natural. So I was, I had God gifted eye hand coordination, but I was not gifted physically. I was fast, but I was not David Ferrer fast. So I had to work on that incredibly hard. I was also the type of player that had to hit a million balls a day, right? For me to feel confident in my ability, I needed to hit and hit balls all day long so that I developed the confidence in myself to be able to go out and compete. And I needed a lot of points and sets and a lot of discipline training and, and, uh, and a lot of hard physical training for me to feel fit out there and, and think my way through matches, Mm -hmm. which, uh, which I think translates very well into coaching because it didn't come that easy for me. And so when I had to use my brain to break down tennis players across the net and maybe players that were more physically gifted than me or, had uh, had bigger shots than me. To me, that could translate into a pretty good coach. So, but I mean, this took work on your part. It started when I was six, Lisa. 
<laughs> right. Right. So, I mean, yeah. that's, I, mean, I think that's an important point for people to understand is, you know, it's all well and good to, you know, like, like your student Ronnie has gotten to hit with a bunch of pro players, including Kevin Anderson. And I think he hit with Sam Query and, some of the other top guys and, Mal- and that's Malfeast and Malfeast. And, right. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's an amazing opportunity, but that's, that's a hitting session. It's not that person coaching them. And I think to, you know, to, to have someone, I mean, we're seeing it now with Robbie Ginepri, you know, former top pro player. He has an Academy here in Atlanta. My son used to train there and Robbie is now coaching with USTA and he's doing a phenomenal job. But, you know, this is not a guy who retired from professional tennis and all of a sudden decided he was going to become a coach. Right. Right. I mean, he's like you. He's he's this is a guy who has honed his craft. He's had mentors who have helped him. And, you know, now he's he's doing a bang up job out there. But but not every former pro has that skill or the desire to learn the skill to be a top coach. Yeah. It just, it just depends what they have a passion to do. Right. Um, for me, the, 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 the next best thing to competing at a, at a high level was for me to, for, for me to translate all the things that I learned as a tennis player from when I was six to when I retired from the tour at 26 and deliver my information to young developing junior players that are serious, that really want to achieve their goals. So for me, that's, that's very enjoyable on a daily basis. It's something that I enjoy doing. If I didn't enjoy doing it, then I wouldn't do it. It's very simple. Um, so that, that, that's what, that's what gives me joy. So it's, it's not just collecting a paycheck, but I enjoy doing it. So it, it depends on, depends on what, what, what you have a passion to do. Right. Well, let's talk about college coaches a little bit because we've been focused on the junior coaches, but there are different types of college coaches as well. Absolutely. So in, in my generation of of players that I competed with, whether it was amateur or professional tennis, most of them went into college coaching and, and it's, it's exciting and it's fun and you have a, guaranteed paycheck and and uh and it's it's an incredible atmosphere it's great for your family um so it's uh it's it's definitely a win-win it's not something that that i wanted to get into because i didn't really want to leave the area of south florida because my whole family is here and everything so many of the players that i competed with they had to travel around all all throughout the united states getting relocated to try to get into that head coaching job Mm -hmm. um so it's 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 not something that I per se wanted to do, but uh, but many of the guys that I competed with, they they did, and they and maybe their assistant their assistants now, and they're trying to slide into a great head coaching job, or and and many did slide into a great head coaching job, which is which is fantastic. Um, the way that I the way that I kind of look at it is, I kind of wish that that some of some of those guys were, were in junior development because I think it may hurt the country. A little bit that that they're in college coaching and they're not and they're not developing some of our best talent in the United States, but obviously it's their choice to so what what level of uh, level of tennis that they would love to coach. Now, in, in terms in terms of of college coaching, you, you you definitely have many different personalities in college coaching as well as in junior coaching. Um, you could have a, a college coach who's a manager. Maybe he doesn't love to coach. Maybe the assistant coach is doing most of the coaching and he's kind of just managing the team and recruiting the best players that he can. So you you may have a coach like that. You may have a coach that's very hands-on that really wants to try to develop tennis players, which is, which is great. Depends on what your child really wants to, uh, wants to achieve with their college career. And then, and, um, you know, it's really on a case to case basis. Um, so, uh, you know, but but what, what what I can tell you about college tennis is that, and and I've written I've written an article on this as well is that when you come through the door to go play college tennis, your child needs to be a produced tennis player. And 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 what what do I mean by that? So you want to make sure that your child is 
technically sound. You want to make sure that they're, they're tactically sound, physically strong and able to handle the workouts. The college coach's job is not to be teaching your child how to hit a forehand, backhand, serve, those types of things. They want those things taught, learned, owned, honed in and everything before you walk into college tennis. If you're still trying to develop some of those things, when you go into college, you, you're, you're, you're possibly going to be in trouble. So their job is to produce, to put out the best product that they can, which is the best team that they can, the best six players that they can in singles and the best six players that they can in doubles and to win as many matches as they can. College coaching is is a business as well, and so if their if if their team is not getting better or, or thriving, the college coach may, may be getting fired, and so they may be looking for other employment, and so that that's that's why they they're looking at those certain things. Well, and I will say because I I know a lot of the college coaches like you do, there are some coaches out there that are truly committed to the emotional and physical and growth um, of their team. It's not just about winning and losing. Um, like you said, I have definitely met my fair share that of, of head coaches that are managers. They're just simply interested in recruiting the best players they can. And, you know, they leave the day-to-day work to the assistants. But I've also met my fair share of coaches who – invite the players into their homes who, you know, have sit down one-on-ones with players to make sure that their schoolwork's going all right, that their social life is going okay, that, you know, they're, they're getting what they need both from a tennis perspective, but also emotionally while they're in college. Um, And then of course, you know, there are those coaches that fall in between, you know, that, that may be, you know, can do both well. But in my experience, it's rare to find a coach that, that is a a strict manager, but also has that concern for their players. Typically the ones that, that are more intimately involved personally with the players. And I mean, you know, that are concerned about how their grades are and how their classes are going and are they making friends on campus and, is their living situation okay? And are they homesick? And and all of that kind of stuff. They those types of coaches typically have assistants who are better at managing the other piece of the pie, which is the recruiting and the day to day, you know, business side. So, I, I think you're right. I think it's really important to understand what type of coach your child will thrive under, and ask the questions to help you figure out if that's the coach that your, your kid is going to have when they get to a school. And all that said, you can make a great decision, a great informed decision. And the month before your child shows up for their freshman year, the coach could take a job somewhere else. So (laughs) it happens all the time, which makes the college game very, very challenging. Yeah, you're, you're a hundred percent right. You could, you couldn't have said it any better. And, and on, on top of it, I, I can tell you that there are some college coaches that are really, really tough disciplinarian coaches. So there, there are children that are that are signing at schools and not really understanding how tough it is. And when they come through the door and they start to to go through workouts, whether they're they're physical or tennis workouts, that can be a little bit of a shock to the system as well. My goal is to make sure that that none of my players. Are, are surprised or, or, or not in shape when they, when they walk through the door to, to, to start enduring their, their college workouts. But some, some coaches are unbelievably tough on the players. And, uh, you know, it just, it just really depends on, you know, how, how your child responds and then what they're looking for. Right. Right. And again, you know, you have to ask the questions just like you do when you're looking for a junior coach for your child. Absolutely. You, you you have to do your research. You have, you have to speak to the current players that are on the team, former players, and, and you need to find out as much information as you can and, and make an educated decision on what, what university will, will be the best fit for your, for your child. 
Sure. Sure. Well, Todd, this has all been very enlightening. Thank you. And I'm really glad we had this conversation because it's been a while since we've talked about the different types of coaches and, you know, we can all use a reminder of, of what we need to be looking for as parents when choosing the right coach for our child as they go through their developmental years. Um, is there anything else we haven't touched on that you want to want to hit on before we close this one out? No, I think, uh, I think, I think we just about uh, touched base on, on all the, all the subjects of coaching that, awesome. uh, that we wanted to speak about. Awesome. Well, just so my listeners know, I'll have a link to that Tony Nadal TED talk because y'all should definitely check that out. It's worth listening to. And Todd, as always, thank you for doing the podcast. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. And I always learn something every time we talk. So I will have a link to your website and your contact info in the show notes as well. So to my listeners, thank you for tuning in and we will catch you next time on Parenting Aces. I'm Lisa Stone, and you've been listening to the Parenting Aces podcast. For tennis parents, by a tennis parent. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to us and write a review on iTunes. For more information on navigating the junior and college tennis journey, please visit us online at parentingaces.com. Thanks for tuning in and sharing us with your tennis community.